Let's begin by stating that evolution by natural selection is an observable fact. Expose some bacteria to antibiotics, chance mutations lead to resistant ones, the rest die, and soon they're all descended from the resistant ones. That's evolution by natural selection. Speciation, or the production of new biological species, is also an observable fact. We have observed the emergence of new species of microorganisms, plants, and animals. We know so much about it that we have, new, we have terminology to describe the different kinds of speciation that can occur. If you understand biochemistry, none of this is surprising at all. DNA undergoes mutation. New genes means the expression of new proteins with the potential for novel functionality and eventually completely different organisms. This happens faster than one might think. Even a single point mutation can produce legs where antennas should be, additional sets of wings, and other remarkable changes. Kent will respond by saying that these are never different kinds of organisms. Well, what is a kind? This word is in the Bible, but it's incredibly vague. We can read about cattle, a creeping kind, and a beast kind. What is creeping? What counts as a beast? Who knows? Science is not vague like this. A species is a group of organisms capable of interbreeding. So if organisms can produce viable fertile offspring, they're of the same species. So is a kind a species? Well, then the argument is false. Speciation occurs. There are new kinds. Is a kind some other taxonomic category, like a phylum or something else? Then that's no problem, because new species always belong to the same clade. When eukaryotes first evolved, every descendant thereafter was a eukaryote, no matter what else they became. Animals always produce animals, mammals always produce mammals, and so forth. So if a kind is anything other than a species, this will not contradict evolution in any way whatsoever. Instead of defining the term, Kent will perpetuate the ambiguity of the Bible because he needs to blur its meaning to suit his argument. Now, if speciation happens today, it's logical to extrapolate that it has produced all the species that are already here. If this is the case, there should be some evidence. For example, shouldn't there have been any intermediary species? Well, fortunately, fossils exist. And after we found enough of them, we were able to identify more transitional species than you can shake a stick at. We have fossils that bridge from fish to tetrapods, from land mammals to ocean mammals, from dinosaurs to birds, and every other transition you can think of. We also see that fossils deeper in the ground, which are older, are less and less similar to currently existing life, which supports slow change over time. This is such strong evidence for evolution that Kent will have to resort to claiming that the geologic column does not exist, that this is a baseless lie. Furthermore, we can figure out how old these things are with radiometric dating, another technique that Kent will desperately accuse of being invalid without any basis whatsoever. Isotopic decay rates are constant, and measuring their levels reveals their age. We can corroborate these ages by using multiple nuclides, and when we get the same age using uranium dating as with potassium argon dating, the notion that these coincidentally offer the same result not once but thousands of times is a statistical absurdity. We can also compare with unrelated methods like tree ring dating or referencing documented historical events. Radiometric dating works, period. Then with biogeography, we predict the locations of fossils based on the configuration of prehistoric landmasses. And guess what? We do indeed find them there. You can't get more empirical than, I bet I'll find this thing here, and then you look and you do. Now, Kent will say that none of this is proof of anything. Well, proof is exclusively for mathematics and logic, so anyone who asks for proof in science has no idea how science works. In science, we only say that something's consistent beyond reasonable doubt. For example, a very old Earth is consistent beyond reasonable doubt, as is agreed upon by literally all geologists, the people who study the Earth for a living. So when someone uneducated like Kent says anything that contrary, it is totally baseless and can only be traced back to one piece of supposed evidence. Some book says a thing. Similarly, all biologists agree that evolution by natural selection is consistent beyond reasonable doubt. But Kent will say, some book says a thing. Kent also strangely proposes that many unrelated fields are somehow part of evolution. Most people would refuse to discuss these subjects in a debate on evolution. However, I'm very interested in demonstrating that Kent has no idea what he is talking about in virtually any academic field. So I'm going to permit the discussion of these topics, and I hope very much that he wishes to discuss them. In fact, let's introduce them now. Kent wants to know about what he calls cosmic evolution, which he thinks is the origin of time, space, and matter in a huge explosion. The Big Bang was actually the origin of space time and energy, not matter, and it wasn't an explosion. 
on educated people like Kent imagine the Big Bang as fully formed planets and galaxies tumbling out of a kablooey graphic. This would indeed be quite absurd. In actuality, the model describes the universe arising from an initial singularity and then progressing through a series of epochs that require a lot of knowledge in particle physics to understand. Atoms took 380,000 years to form and stars and galaxies took 150 million. There's overwhelming evidence to support all of this. One, the recession velocities of galaxies and the expansion of the universe. Two, the cosmic microwave background radiation, a remnant of the recombination event predicted by the model and confirmed observation. Three, the ratio of hydrogen to helium that is predicted by the model and confirmed by observation. Four, hypothetical particles from early epochs that are confirmed in particle accelerators. Astronomers unanimously agree that this model is consistent beyond reasonable doubt. So when Kent begs to differ, once again, he can only respond with, some book says a thing. Next, Kent wants to know about what he and no one else calls chemical evolution. He wants to know where all the elements come from. They're made in stars, Kent. This is immaculately well understood. The process is called stellar nucleosynthesis. It's really hot in those stars, so all those nuclei are whizzing around, and sometimes they fuse. Two protons gives us helium, four is beryllium, six is carbon, eight is oxygen, and so forth. This goes all the way up to iron inside a star. Heavier than iron requires high energy events like supernovae, and the very heaviest are synthetic produced only in particle accelerators. Readers. There is all the elements, no problem. Next, Kent wants to know about the evolution of stars and planets. Again, no mystery here. Hydrogen collected by gravity to form stars. Stars fuse all the elements. Eventually, they explode. All that matter collects to form another star. And now, with all those other elements, there will be a protoplanetary disk from which planets can form. This is exceptionally well understood, and we can see nebulae and protostars all over the galaxy. There is zero controversy about any of this in the astrophysics community. So if Kent has an objection, it would no doubt be based on the fact that some book says a thing. Lastly, Kent wants to know about how life came about on Earth. This is called abiogenesis, and plenty of work has been done here. In the 50s, it was shown that amino acids form spontaneously in early Earth conditions, and the same has been shown for nucleotides. Ribonucleotides polymerize on hot clay to produce RNA, and we've observed ribozymes, which have catalytic function, and thus offer an early mode of self-replication. Amino acids must also polymerize to form proteins, and there are several viable hypotheses as to how this happened. If Kent is interested in discussing organometallic catalysis, I would be happy to elucidate further. Finally, amphiphilic molecules spontaneously self-assemble into ordered structures structures like micelles and bilayers, making boundary formation the least mysterious aspect of abiogenesis. Only with knowledge in biochemistry has abiogenesis become quite sensible, so it's not surprising that Kent rejects it because he has zero knowledge of biochemistry. The only evidence Kent can ever cite is some book, which is allegedly written by an omniscient deity but doesn't bother mentioning anything scientific anywhere. Why doesn't it reference bacteria or DNA or the laws of physics? That would be quite something, and also trivial for the God that created the universe. And yet, nothing intelligent is in this book at all. That's because in actuality, the book was written by ancient, ignorant, immoral men, and it's not evidence of anything whatsoever. I look forward to demonstrating this repeatedly throughout the debate.